Fresh Economic Thinking podcast, new ideas and analysis with Dr. Cameron Murray and Jonathan Gadir. Good day, Cameron. How are you going? Good, thanks, Jonathan. How have you been? It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. I've been、uh, overseas. I went to、uh, Israel to see the relatives, and I stopped in a few places like Singapore and Dubai, all of which are very expensive. And、uh, I'm back, and、uh, <sighs> I have to say that it's quite funny seeing a lot of the the rage against airlines. I mean, it's it is justified. They treat people like shit, but. I always think、yep. that、um, you know when an industry treats consumers like shit, and as though consumer protection rules don't apply to them,、um, like losing bags and you know not communicating and just like treating people like crap, it's usually because they actually don't have to abide by them because the industry they're in is kind of a monopoly or almost a monopoly. Yeah. And I just think when I see people say, "Oh, that's it, I'm done with Qantas," which I also feel totally.、Um, I just wonder. Well, really, next time you want to fly somewhere, and you you really think you're going to have that many other options? Maybe Singapore Airlines, but they're going to charge a heap more, and you're probably not going to be willing to pay it. You know? Yeah, that's right. No, that's totally right.、Um, I, look, I, I think it will improve over time, but yeah, yeah, it's been terrible everywhere lately for air travel.、Um, I, I often think.、Uh, This is one of those examples where we decided we could switch the economy off and on and again, and it would all be fine. And maybe that's not really the case. We talk about supply chains. Well, I think the airline is the lived experience of a supply chain disruption due to shutdown. But、uh, yeah, good point. It's exactly the same in even in Israel. Like news stories about you know big room in the airport where the bags are just chucked because there's not enough staff to. Do it properly, <laughs> you know. The baggage handling is just not able to get back up to ramp up to the scale it needs to because people have gone on to do other things in their life and they just can't hire. Yeah, people. That's right. Any anyone who was a baggage handler two years ago is probably not a baggage handler today. So yeah,、uh, they've had to rebuild from scratch. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's、um, nice to have you back. Thank you. Yes, good to be back. And let's talk about a Barney that actually someone at work contacted me about, which is like about the incentives that may or may not apply to economists when they take funding or money or fees to do studies. Tell me a bit about this particular one that got my work colleague interested.、I、believe it has to do with Uber. Yeah, that's right.、Uh, so. About a week ago,、um, there were the Uber files, which were a leaked cache of documents from Uber that got released, and、uh, it was found that Uber paid one hundred thousand dollars to Alan Kruger, an economist, to write a paper that was very favourable of their business model using their corporate data,、um, and. In the years until now, since that paper was written, no one really knew about that hundred thousand dollar payment, and it's all come out、um, in the press now. And what's really interesting in the Barney is that、uh, Justin Wolfers, who's an Australian economist living in the U.S., very high profile, has come out on Twitter defending him, saying,、oh, "I knew Alan well enough to know a bit the." About the market price for his time, it's extremely unlikely he would have agreed to write a paper for a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> and of course,、uh, of course, Too journalist、low. Felix. Yeah, well, journalist Felix Salmon replies, but he did write a paper for one hundred thousand dollars. And this is, you know, this is a bit of the mindset of how captured economists are. Who, and it's very funny, you know, incentives apply to everyone else except economists. Justin Wolfers wrote on on Twitter in response to Felix Salmon, the journalist, pointing this out. He said, "I think you're missing the point. It's likely he found the Uber data irresistibly interesting. I would have. That Uber wanted to send him a check was likely beside the point.、Mm -hmm. And、okay. like, really, you know,、uh, you know, you might be pretty well off guy, but someone sending you a hundred grand." Um, to get on your spreadsheet and do a little data manipulation, write a short report. You know, there's an incentive there. What、yeah. what was really interesting and and turned this from just you know a hilarious、uh, sort of 
insight that we've known about since um what's that great film that came out after the financial crisis um the big shot about uh now the one about insiders trading uh and they interviewed all the uh they interviewed all these academics at these um high profile universities and saying well is it okay that this academic uh you know uh is earning all this money on the side from doing all this consulting work for these vested interests and the heads of these schools at harvard and princeton and all that just you know stare blankly and and make themselves look like fools it's called inside job the film i think it was from uh, 2010 or 2011 Okay. So, so it's a bit of a rehash of the same thing we know is going on, but it's very high profile and about Uber. And, but what makes it a Barney is, is I realized that, um, Justin Wolfer's mates, uh, academic mates in Australia have started a little firm called E61, which is, you know, like any other economics consulting firm. Uh, and Justin Wolfer's is a senior academic fellow for them. So he helps them out with advice, you know, he's not on the payroll, but they too have, used uber data to uh to write a paper that's called gig economy labor market so essentially you know his mate's uh economic consulting firm in australia has done exactly the same thing as alan kruger so i pointed that out on on twitter and and justin got back to me and he said you know you ought to know that this e61 is not a consulting firm but a not-for-profit economic research institute and as a senior academic fellow, I provide advice in exchange for zero dollars. Which, of course, I didn't say he got paid. I just thought it was an interesting coincidence. That yeah. His 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 mate's firm also got their hands on Uber data and wrote a report, which I assume they didn't write for free. And he's out there defending Alan Kruger for taking a hundred thousand dollars for a very important, high profile uh, report that justified a lot of Uber's business practices. So is it, what's your position on stuff like this? Okay, let's forget about the fact that he, you know, probably was incentivized to, you know, write a report that's favorable to Uber. Like generally, do you think that economists are blind to the bias that is created when they take money from, you know, uh, a client? No, no, not at all. Economists are as, as, as groupy and as human as the rest of us, you know, they, they like to be socially accepted and they, they like money. <laughs> so I think they're exactly the same. I guess, you know, I do consulting work as well and I get paid from various organizations. And I think the important thing is to differentiate what's, you know, an academic paper and what's a sort of paid consulting report, a glossy report. And, and in cases like this where it's like, oh, no, we're just doing research here out out in the wilderness as academics, and here's an interesting finding. Uh, I think readers and policy people get a a different view or perception that oh, that, you know, a university did that. Whereas if you do work for a company and publish it under the company's brand and go, you know, I got paid to write this for the company, then people take it with a grain of salt and understand that it's you know part of the corporate. Uh, uh debate that they're having so i think that's an important distinction so mm. uh it doesn't seem to happen much in the us but in many ways this is this is the role of economists right um manipulating the public debate for for, for their tribe however that may, might be all right so now on to our topic for today you want to talk about um a an update to your book yeah, that's right. So on the 2nd of August, 2022, the second edition of Game of Mates that was originally released in 2017 is coming out and it's now got a new title. It's called Rigged, How Networks of Powerful Mates Rip Off Everyday Australians. Um, it's you know predominantly the same book. It's updated figures, updated examples in different chapters, an extra chapter on the COVID period and uh it's now published by alan and unwin so i'm hoping it it reaches a broader audience now and and the message in there can be more widely digested in the policy discourse because the the problem of uh political favoritism 
the revolving door, and everyday Aussies getting ripped off has certainly not gone away. Okay. So let's dig in a bit to something that is uh, or you know updated or something that's new in this edition. Um, you, you mentioned a, a section on the COVID period. Um, yeah, that's right. And maybe you can start with that one and then we can go from there. What's been super interesting lately is... Um, and, and we mention it in the book, which was, you know, the text was finished more than six months ago. Yep. Uh, but what's been interesting in the last few weeks is that all these quarantine facilities that we decided were really important and that we had to, um, we had to quickly build, they were the top priority for us. Uh, we spent 400 million on one of them in Brisbane. That's not quite finished yet. And before it's even done, we've decided we've got no use for it. We spent $220 million on the Wellcamp one in Toowoomba. That was part of a secret contract with the Wagner family to do that. We've also decided we have no use for that anymore. Uh, between Sydney and Melbourne and elsewhere, it seems like the country spent a billion dollars building quarantine facilities that nobody wants anymore. And they do not know what to do with them. And... Yeah, we he made the point that this could have been known in advance and we didn't have to do it. And as as time rolls on, we're seeing that 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 sort of prediction is more right than it's ever been. So that's just one example. But another one is uh Australia buying two hundred and fifty million doses of various COVID vaccines. Two hundred and fifty million doses. I don't even think we know yet what we have spent collectively on these things, but everyone's vaccinated to their eyeballs now. No one wants any more vaccinations, and it looks like something like ninety percent of what we'd bought is going to go to waste. Either we'll pay the contract and not get them delivered, or they're delivered and they're going to end up in the bin because we can't uh, preserve them and keep them from uh, going bad. You know, the Pfizer one needs uh, refrigeration, etc. Yeah. So we're talking here, even at a few dollars a dose, another few billion dollars um, uh, in vaccines. That's excluding the cost of rolling them out and all the rest. And here we are today. We've got the peak peak COVID outbreak uh, in mid-2022. So the, their effectiveness was not very good. So the quarantine, we went through that, wasted billions. The vaccines, we went through that, wasted billions. Uh, and all the way, plenty of insiders uh, were supported. We note in the book things like Orders of Australia being used to reward people for their loyalty to the government of the day, to their insider mates. And we can see that, I believe in Queensland, Jeanette Young was the chief health officer uh -huh. during the initial panic. Where is she now? Queensland Governor General. Uh huh. Okay. You know, so yeah. you get this new title and new pay packet for playing your role during this period, supporting your mates and those networks. And then later they reward you with this cushy job and this high profile appointment. Um, and in terms of the revolving door, I think it's more relevant than ever. Uh, we've seen the John Barillaro controversy of creating a half million dollar a year trade commissioner for New South Wales job uh, that he then appointed himself to before he... Uh, quit politics yeah and uh you know it's it, it just goes on and on uh so yeah that's it, that's sort of the yeah. the so few recent things that have happened the 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 vaccine thing is just extraordinary and it's not the first time tammy flu do you remember tammy flu like there was supposed to be this very uh, you know you know this wonder drug for um i think it was it swine flu or bird flu or one of those and yeah it, we we bought like a massive stockpile and then it turns out a few months later actually it's actually it, it, it's no better than a placebo and it has absolutely no uh there's no evidence that it you know it actually does anything but before yeah. before we realized that we'd already bought i don't know however much it was some ridiculous amount of the stuff all right look uh there's you know the incentives in pharmaceuticals we we note it in the rigged uh this new edition uh, we only have a few updates in that section, but this is a, a long-term play by pharmaceutical companies to get uh, new drugs that may or may not work very well onto public uh, subsidized 
drug lists. That is really where the big game is. And that's why so many doctors get uh, flown to conferences by pharmaceutical companies, given uh, gifts and all those sorts of things. So uh, this is an ongoing thing. And I think what we've realized, in well, I've realized, you've realized, but a lot of people haven't realized that COVID was an amazing opportunity to ramp this up. Uh-huh. Yep. Right? A lot of people still, and this puzzles me uh, in general, uh, who were critical of the pharmaceutical industry just three years ago, yep, suddenly forgot that, and they're like, no, 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 they wouldn't, they wouldn't sell us a billion doses or two hundred fifty million doses of a drug that doesn't really work and um, is really high risk because you know this is a pandemic, this is important. Yeah, you know, they might do that on your average disease, which is unimportant, but on this one they wouldn't. Yeah. And I think that was completely naive, and and we point that out, obviously. Um, I mean, all the biggest scams in pharmaceuticals were for very important diseases with drugs that didn't work and had terrible side effects. Yeah. Uh, And there's been so many fines. So that's just one interesting uh, case. Yeah. It's such a great example of the lack of nuance that we have now, that if you're in, you know, the progressive slash left-wing tribe, you can't believe anymore anything bad about uh, pharmaceutical companies pushing these vaccines because that would be saying something that those kind of people say, you know, and that you can't have yeah. that. So, That's right. Yep. Yeah, it's, pre- it's pretty bizarre how the tribal lines have been drawn. Um, but, you know, there's, there's some really interesting examples that are still in the news. Uh, for example, the new Labor treasurer, Jim Chalmers is his name, I believe, uh, has announced uh, a, a review into superannuation and it was only just a year or two ago that the previous lnp government uh tightened up a lot of rules on super and and gave them more obligations to disclose to members um there's this sort of rank and yank process of underperforming funds um, being penalized and it looks like labor funnily enough is ready to unwind some of those rules and so I find this, very, you know, it's one of my bugbears and there's a chapter in Rigged on superannuation that the Labor Party is so tied to the privatization of retirement and this big financial game that when there's a choice to side with the members of super funds or the managers of super funds in terms of these, uh, these super regulations that the LNP introduced, they're willing to side with the super managers and the various union officials that stock the you know the boards and the the management teams of these funds rather than the actual members and the workers who put their hard earned savings into these funds and pay the fees over their whole lifetime so i think that's just another recent example of how uh, entrenched the game still is how willing and able the networks of powerful mates are uh, still to rip off everyday Australians and and lie about it essentially, um, tell each other, oh yeah, when we're we're removing the obligation for your super fund to look out for your financial interest, uh, but we're doing it for you. Now, how is that possible? Uh-huh. How is that possible? So that's just another another case. So the the networks are still going, the political insiders are still playing, and uh, we're still being ripped off. And so I think it's timely that, uh, yeah, we get this new edition of the book out there mm-hmm. and, and shake the tree a little and, and see how people respond. Uh, have you got anything in, in the book on why it costs so much to build transport infrastructure? Well, yeah, funny you say that. Pretty much every, every place complains about why it's so expensive to build trains and roads in our city. Australia complains and compares ourselves to America. Americans complain, compare themselves to somewhere else. New Zealand complains and go, we're the most expensive place to build a road or a tunnel. <laughs> Everyone complains. Yeah. Uh, this is, this is, so my point being, it's very hard to distinguish the truth from the political games that accompany any major project like this. Like, at the end of the day, you stop complaining when you've done something a few times and get good at it and you've got the right machines. So in Brisbane, for example, the first uh, 
tunnel under the Brisbane river, very controversial. Everyone complained. Why is it so expensive? But now that we've got a bunch of tunneling machines and a few companies that really have a lot of expertise, no one really complains about the cost of tunneling anymore. Mm -hmm. We're kind of used to it. Um, so I think it's more a political, a political thing than, than anything else. And also we, we do, this is, uh, probably the more interesting contribution of this book in terms of investing in public infrastructure is not talking about what it costs to construct new roads, but the choices we make of which roads and which tunnels to build, because the, uh, you know, you can build a road that has a huge economic benefit if it connects the right part of the network or a rail extension, uh, or you can do one that produces a huge profit, for example, for the toll road owner, but does so because it reduces the throughput of the rest of the network and forces people onto your toll road. And that's what we explicitly model in the book, in the appendix, we use this big database of, uh, Australian transport projects and the benefit cost ratios and the estimated traffic volumes. And we show that a lot of the cost from our big transport projects comes because we choose to invest in the wrong ones that don't have huge benefits because they are the easiest to toll and make the most benefits for your public private toll road partner in construction. So we'll spend the same, you know, billions of dollars, but we'll get a lower social benefit, but a higher private benefit because of it's a, it's a better road to toll, but it's only a better road to toll because it's a worse road to improve the total throughput of the network. So that's just another case uh, where there's this hidden cost that is hard to see that we try and bring out and make explicit and explain the incentives and the dynamics at play. And there's an interesting case in Brisbane of the airport link where two former politicians uh, got a $50 million success fee for cutting a deal to create a, uh, the airport tunnel, I believe it was, um, that is, you know, relatively empty and not a high priority road, but you know, they were willing to impose that huge cost on the rest of us because they got that success fee and they, uh, use their networks to favor themselves. So that's sort of the yeah. types of insights that you get in the book. Just going back to the effects of COVID, a lot of people are puzzled about why suddenly it's so hard to find labor, or at least they're encountering a lot of services or retail outlets that they're used to encountering are telling them that they can't find staff. And I'm wondering, do you have mm -hmm. any particular uh, insights onto why this has suddenly happened, apart from the fact that in you know restaurants there are no international students or there are fewer now, therefore waiters and waitresses and those kind of jobs are harder to fill. But like in other areas of the economy, which are normally filled by locals, do you have any like, insights into yeah, why? Yeah, no, I, look, I, I don't have any great detailed insights. I have, you know, some high level thinking that, that I helps me make sense of things. Uh, and it's funny you ask because a couple of other mates of mine have said, said to me, where have all the workers gone? I just yeah. don't get it. Yeah. can't find anyone. And yet in a lot of sectors, it's still not flowing through to wages. I think it, I think it will this year. Um, I, I've just seen a few ads coming up, you know, on, on, on my internet browsing of sign on bonuses for different types of jobs. And a lot of people are moving jobs. Uh, but I think it's uh, just a, simply a product of uh, a couple of things. The first is the sort of the shutdown of the economy and the fact that we all went from the normal distribution of spending to just uh, goods and no services and no travel. And now we've swung wildly back the other way and everyone has adjusted in one direction. Now all of a sudden we're panicking and we're adjusting in the other direction. So it's just, there's a high adjustment cost to this. Mm. So I think a lot of it is to do with that. And secondly, demand is still very high. We are having an economic boom. We did spend hundreds of billions of fiscal policy that people couldn't spend in 2020, that they started spending in 2021 and they're still spending today. So 
the data from, for example, the Commonwealth Bank showed a huge pool of savings in people's bank accounts at the end of last year that they're slowly spending now. So people are still spending more than they're earning in this period because they saved so much in 2020 and 2021 and got all the stimulus as well. So it's a combination of overall extra spending and this weird shift to goods and not services and not travel and then a shift back. And I think it's just very disruptive um, to the labor market. Now, yeah, uh, other uh, are the uh, international students a factor? Yeah. You know, in Sydney and Melbourne um, in 2017 and 2018, international students were about one in five people aged under 30 in these cities. It's uh, Don't quote me on that exact number, but there's an interesting report um, that I read that quantified this, and it was just this enormous share of the younger workforce in the yeah, capital cities. Yeah, totally. But to me, that's the obvious one. Like, that's clear, right? There's fewer of them. They're also not here spending their money as well. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, they used to work in these things, but they also used to go to all the cafes and they used to also spend their money in the economy and, and go to yeah. the bars and do stuff as well as work there. So, yeah, it can partly be that. And but, like, where's the ba- with the baggage handlers? Certainly. Where are they? Well, they're definitely not. Well, what did they what were they meant to do the last two years? I guess. I know, I know, but what are they doing? My I point. <laughs> the, I don't know. They're probably working in construction. That's what okay. I would be doing. Yeah, that's actually right. right? Um, that's the only industry that's like absolutely in, that, insane. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I would be doing. If I was a young, fit guy, I would just be unloading trucks for a construction company at a work site and making good money. Uh, you know, I used to do that when I was 19, lab- laboring on construction sites. That's what I would do now. And I'd, instead of, you know, loading bags at the airport, for sure. Um, you know, I had, a, I had a friend, actually, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, after the financial crisis in the, the sort of post-financial crisis slump we had, he, was, he used to sell IT products. And then uh, because of the stimulus, there was a whole lot of uh, construction work. And so he quit that to go and pour concrete instead so people are mobile if you, if you let them be and they will go where the money is um but yeah i think it's a combination of things and i don't i don't think i've got the exact right answer but i think those are a few ideas that can maybe help help understand what's happening very good we've solved most of the world's problems in this discussion i i like it um we'll be uh back next week thanks very much for joining me again this week great to chat good to have you back jonathan